You're listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and the interview subject that you've tuned in to hear from is Danny Filth. Danny Filth is, of course, the front man in long-running UK, I guess you call them black metal, gothic black metal, I suppose that works, outfit, Cradle of Filth. The reason for the conversation is to promote the outfit's 2017 album, Cryptoriana, The Seductiveness of Decay. Let's have a listen to what Danny has to say. Here we go. Danny, I want to start by offering you a sincere congratulations on forging a stellar career creating blackish metal. And in my view, your career is only rivaled by Sata in Satyricon. Now, you started out way back in 1991. Since then, you've released 12 studio albums and God knows how many other fan treats and releases. Mate, when you look back over your career, so over the past 25 odd years of your own recorded music history, what comes to mind? Um, well, it's it's been a lot of fun. It doesn't seem that long. Occasionally, it does. If you if you cast your mind back to the early days, you think, yeah, that was quite a long time ago. But when people remind you of certain periods in time, like for example, when we headlined the B stage at the American Ozfest, that was yeah. Well, I turned thirty on that, and that doesn't seem like fourteen years ago. Well, it just yeah. it seems it seems like eight years ago. And then I, then I think about when we did an amphetamine or pornography or Godspeed and yeah, it, it, it doesn't quite compute. The fact that my daughter's 18 now and about to go to university oh also God. is another. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's a testament to the fact that time does move <laughs> quickly. It does. I remember um, reading the liner notes, and I think you thanked your wife and your daughter in the uh, liner notes for the uh, excellent album Dusk and Her Embrace, mate. So that was way back in 1996. Or maybe it was Quilty well, in the well, Beast. I wouldn't have yeah. thanked my daughter then. She wouldn't have been born. No, she wouldn't have been born. That's what I'm thinking. Gosh, must have been Midian or Cruelty in the Beast, actually, then. So I there you go. think it, was, it would have been Midian, yeah. Midian. We dispensed with the uh, thanks lists on records. One, because we always work with great artists who who do a complete walkthrough of art in the booklet. Mm. Um, and also because when you release an album, an album pretty much once every two years, you're kind of thanking the same people. I just think it's a little bit naff. Yeah. You know what I mean? To, yeah, no, I'm sure. Yeah. There's so many people as well that, that Crater would be indebted to or have thanks for that it would just be – you know, you'd just be wasting paper, basically. Not wasting it, but... Yeah, I know what you're you know. saying. You're doing the same things on, on on the same album, effectively, the it same group of people. just be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we, we dispense with that. We just basically have a, a general acknowledgement for the people who, you know, who know who they are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mate, let's let's have a chat about the new album then, uh, Cryptoriana. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, mate, you won the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, look... It's a very strong Cradle of Filth album, if you don't mind me saying. Probably the strongest since Cruelty and the Beast, in my view. Now, this is the second album where the lineup contains yourself, Martin, Daniel, Lindsay, Richard, and Marrick. And I particularly feel that the performance of the guitar duo on this album, Richard and Marrick, is a highlight. So, would you say that this album, given that you've retained the same lineup from the previous album, uh, Ham- Hammer of the Witches, uh, d- would this album be considered more of a band effort than Hammer? No, I think it's pretty much the same. In fact, um, when we broke de- down the uh, who did what, and, and and it was for no real relevance because everybody contributed pretty much equally, but just out of interest, mm. uh, we were looking at who who did the bulk of this song or that song, etc. It, it pretty much worked out the same uh, as Hammer of the Witches. It, it turned out to be about two songs per person, Um and similar traits were found like for example um the title track was was daniels the bass players for example just little weird things like that sure Hmm. um and the writing process uh well the way it works is everybody who you know because obviously we all live in different galaxies practically um everybody works in their own little world and uh, then we went to Brno in the Czech Republic, which is the home of Marek and, and Martin. Mm-hmm. In, and um, we spent a week and a half there just prior to a festival appearance in Slovakia. 
on the premise that it was uh, a place to clay all the ideas that people had, whether it was whole songs, bits of songs, or just the odd riff to, to, to build the puzzle with. Um, and subsequently, we came back from that with pretty much 85% of the album actually finished. So prolific was the writing prior to going there. Um, and then we spent last autumn um, polishing it. It went through several metamorphoses and um, obviously mutated further in the studio. But yeah, that's that's pretty much the the, 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 the process behind writing. People yeah. always ask, oh, well, because you're scattered everywhere, it must be really difficult. But it's not. Because not we, with technology, we, yeah. Days, well, it's not yeah. just that. We, we come together to do things live. We're obviously in the studio as well. Um, and when we write, we you know, we we do bits and bobs as well on tour, and uh, we've got a huge tour coming up. So, um, the idea is to start the process when we begin touring as well for the next record. Not saying that the next record is going to be exactly two years from now, but it's good to start getting the integral line. You know, the idea is flowing. Sure. Yeah. So, no, uh, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and and where does the album fit into the Cradle of Filth canon of releases? Is it thematically linked to any of the prior releases? Um, not not particularly, no. Although people have noticed, or yeah, have noticed similarities um, in in flavour to previous records. For example, <clears throat> people <clears throat> people said there's been nods to. Even Midian or Cruelty and the Beast, Damnation in a Day, Nymphetamine, mm-hmm. Dusk. Um, and I can only say that's primarily because we're Cradle of Filth. And, um, yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, we're, and a lot of those albums were very twin guitar based. And with, the, with this lineup now, there's a real emphasis on that sort of new, new wave of British heavy metal, which basically... Yeah, that's um, what I'm hearing, but, actually. You're spot on there. Because it, it, the reason I ask the question is, as I say, I'm a big fan of Dusk and Her Embrace and, and Cruelty and the Beast. This is the first album where I'm hearing trace elements of those two albums since then. Well, I think because um, those, those albums were very twin guitar based and we went for a small period where we're in... One guitarist is basically writing most of the material. Was that Paul? Um, was it? That was Paul. Yeah, and mm. then um, obviously we had uh, quite a a lineup shift, and that was due to um, a headline tour we were undertaking with Behemoth, and Paul was living in America at the time, and for some reason he said, "No, I can't do the tour. I've got issues." Blah 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 blah. Long story short. Mm-hmm. So we had to find someone else to do this tour we couldn't pull out of. So we found Richard. And then literally about three weeks before the tour started, James, our session guitar well, I'll say session, he, he, was, he was primarily a live guitarist, um, announced that he was having major neck surgery Jeez. and that he couldn't do the tour either because he wouldn't have been able to play a guitar. So rather than cancel it, uh, Martin... Uh, who had played with Marek before, and obviously a fellow Czech, a Czech mate, um, <laughs> decided, uh, I said, well, yeah, he's he's really good, and put him forward. And the band just literally gelled on that tour and subsequently, you know, formed the lineup that, that you see now. But going back to the, the whole new wave of British heavy metal thing, I don't really like that definition. What it basically boils down to is the twin guitar work, something like Priest, Maiden, or Thin Lizzy. Um, mm. Although it just obviously doesn't sound like that. It sounds like those three bands on crack. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's that's one thing that heralds back to those previous works. So the, the obvious thing. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. That's what I heard straight away. And, and I would say that cruelty, I actually, because I, I host a couple of websites and I've got a podcast, uh, host a podcast series as well as do a radio show. And oftentimes I get asked for my top 10 and cruelty and dusk are both in my top 10 metal albums of all time. And on that note, the, the first time I ever heard Dusk and Her Embrace, this is back in the day, of course, and, and of course you wrote it so you'd know what it was like, but Immortal and Emperor were doing their own things. But when I heard Dusk, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, to be frank. 
It is such a groundbreaking album and was such a refreshing sound from the cardboard box bass drum, angry bees and a beehive guitar tone that so many black metal bands of the year are used, not to mention all of the copycat, mayhem, Dimisteri, Dom, Satanus tribute bands. But when you look back on that release in particular, were you aware what you were doing with that album would change the game? Um, kind of, yeah, I suppose so, because it was our second attempt at the album. Um, obviously last year we released our first attempt at that record because um, initially it was undertaken on cacophonous records and then then there was a fracture in the band and we uh, the people that remained in the band then took the record company to court for various reasons and we eventually won the rights back to the album and so when we did Music for Nations wanted us to re-record it and they put us in with um, a very good producer, uh, which was Kit Wolven. Yeah. yeah. She was the husband of our manager. Yeah. Uh, oh, right. Okay. And, yeah. and uh, he, he was famous for producing a lot of Finn Lizzy records. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he just, yeah, he just wanted to give us a very big organic sound. Uh, and that was always our intention was to, to be, I mean, we were British bands, so we had a, we, you know, we were vastly different from our European counterparts anyway. Mm. Um, yeah, it would interest you as well is that next year is 20-year anniversary of Cruelty and the Beast Jesus. and we're re releasing yeah. the record. Oh, really? Uh, but, but remixed. And um, it's going to sound huge, but also just as atmospheric. But, you know, that's... that's um, very important to us and uh, we've, we've done a test mix for the record company they're quite happy with it we're happy with it so we'll be undertaking that mix I think in November uh, after our British tour and that should see the release uh, around uh, late April next year I believe so it'll be the full album plus Hallow Be Thy Name remix oh, yeah, nice. and hopefully yeah. with, uh, with new artwork artwork that's based on the original artwork um, mm. So yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be interesting. So I'm glad you mentioned Cruelty because, in my view, that is that is the best Blackish metal album ever recorded. And it, also, I think that album consolidated your, consolidated your position as one of the most prominent and certainly, as far as fans are concerned, endearing metal bands of that era. So I'm talking about the late '90s here, because recall in that era, that was by far and away heavy metal's lowest ebb commercially. Metallica had basically become, this is my words here, a butt rock caricature of either Load album series. Pantera were coming apart at the seams, Sepultura split and nobody knew what was going on. Maiden released the simply awful Virtual Eleven with Blaze Bailey and Priest were producing high quality metal that virtually nobody was listening to. So Cruelty and the Beast and also the, the much overlooked follow-up EP, the From the Cradle to Enslaved EP, contain a lineup that I would personally consider to be the band's finest and that's strictly musically speaking. But what do you recall about that era and how important was that era to the band's longevity, i.e. has that acted as the gateway for most Cradle fans, do you think? Or have you got a lot of younger fans these days that probably aren't aware of the impact that you had back in those days? Well, there, there are a lot of gateways into the band. Uh, Dusk, primarily, uh, Midian uh, and Nymphetamine. Um, I think they're the major gateways that I keep hearing from people. But okay. yeah, cruelty was, for, yeah, obviously was a very was a game changer for us. And um, I look back at those times with real fondness. It was a lot of hard work. I remember the studio, you know, being uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, we recorded Depp International, the same place we recorded Duskin, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very. It's not even there anymore. It's literally been ripped from the surface of the earth um and it used to belong to ub40 and uh nice. it, yeah. It was just, yeah it was it was a lovely studio a bit yeah and, um like i said we had a great time there but it was exceedingly hard work and uh, it was you know the lyric everything about it was a lot of hard work so we're very proud of the outcome um aside from the slightly shitty drum production but that was a uh, that was due to our drummer just wanting the the drums to sound very stick thin for some reason. But, oh, so that's um, all Nick's. That's all. That was Nick's idea to have the drum sound that way. It wasn't something that the producer or the band wanted. 
Well, we, we, we attempted to try and, and uh, improve upon it as best as possible. And I think that's one of the reasons why, well, the major reason why we're remixing the record is that mm. we do have a lot of people say, oh, I love that record. The only thing I would change and then blah, 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 the obvious. Yeah, it always comes back to the drum sound. Yeah, I've heard that quite a bit. I tend to overlook well, it because the, the songs sound. are so the strong. Drums are yeah. the, the drums are the basis for the whole record. Mm. So... You know, you can't have a really overly massive guitar sound on it because otherwise it would be like an elephant tramping along a road bridge. <laughs> yeah, look, now I must ask the next question is I've just confirmed that I've got an interview with Stuart Answers coming up next week and I certainly understand that the split really? between... Yeah, yeah, I, I found him and he, he's yeah. been very easy to communicate with, to be honest, over email and, and you know, um, Twitter and Facebook, so... Yeah, we've locked it down for next Thursday. Um, so, yeah, look, I'm actually looking forward to it, as I say, because as a very young guitarist, his was the playing that I think I identified that I tried to copy and play along to on those records, because I am a musician. I'm a bass player primarily, but I also play guitar. But, you know, as I say, look, I understand the split between the band and Stuart and Les wasn't smooth, but is there ever a possibility that... Although, you... although Les is now the tour manager for my other band, Devilman. Aha, uh -huh. okay, and he, he, he's also, I'm hopefully catching up with him when he comes out to Australia with Paradise Lost as well, because I was talking... Yeah, yeah, I was actually on email with him yesterday, strangely enough. Ah, oh, nice. Actually, that's really heartening to hear, because I do love that lineup. but is there ever a possibility that yourself and Stuart could ever be on the same stage ever again? Um, I doubtful. Doubtful because uh, we've got such a, a strong lineup at present, and we're very, very close as a band. Mm. Um, when, when we, for example, um, my band Devilman played a download, uh, not download, what am I talking about? Bloodstock, mm. uh, about, well, yeah, it'd be a month, a month today, actually we played and, um, I went to stay with, uh, Richard, the cradle guitarist for the weekend because yep. he lives quite close to the festival site. Um, and also when we, when we, um, we go touring, the whole band, you know, spend a lot of time. We go out sightseeing a lot, and we do a lot of these sort of um, what they called um, uh, team build. Not they seem like team building exercises. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Though. Um, yeah, like like what we yeah, do. And so, I've just finished working at Telstra, which is a large telecommunications company. We used to do those things all the time, but they're almost necessary, aren't they, when you work in small groups? Well, it's it's a case of they're not exactly planned but we go out of our way to make sure that every you know we're all doing stuff so we have a day off in paris for example mm. we'll, we'll plan a day or not plan it or just you know just go out and hear as many um sites as as possible and go to dinner and stuff like that you know try and keep it as civil as possible as, yeah i get well, what you're as saying, close yeah. as possible because it, it's just a good feeling and um yeah, we like I say, we've got a massive world tour coming up, and so when you go embark on something that um, rigorous, you've got to be great, great friends. And back in the day with Crawley, we were all good friends, but it took its toll on us because we were young, and um, yep. you know we we were in party party mode, and people and people and promoters and venues still fear the name Cradle of Filth <laughs> because the team because of you know, the mischief and that we used to get up to, you know, yep. drinking and fighting and um, generally being a nuisance back in that day. But obviously, fast forward uh, 20 years and we're obviously a, a, a maturer, he says. <laughs> <laughs> I am on a four-month uh, alcohol hiatus. So, um, oh, yeah, God, how I have you done that? <laughs> I wish I could do that. Hey? I wish I could do that. I can't stay I'm away from four, it. I'm only four weeks into it. So, oh, right. you know, I'd say four months, but it's not even a month yet. Um, so, yeah, we, we were a very different band. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I wish, I mean, I love the old days and I love everything we got up to. It was amazing. Wouldn't change it for, for the world. But mm. some part of me wishes that we'd been as professional as we are now back then. But then, you know, that's, that's you know, you can say that about anything and you have to go through uh, those changes. You have to sit in that chrysalis for a while before mm. before yeah. you emerge as a big, horrible-looking moth. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's so true. I think we all sort of look back to our early 20s and think, shit, did I really do or say that? And look, I suppose it's just one of those things that they're more amplified in, in a band, aren't they? And, and have you had any contact with Stuart since, I think we, he left the band in year 2000 or late 1999, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it was actually two, the year two thousand. Hmm. Uh, Nick left uh, nineteen ninety nine. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. It was two thousand. Yeah, I believe it was two thousand. It sounds about maybe right. Yeah, it, it was. It's around remember, around that era. Maybe it was nineteen ninety nine. I remember reading it in Metal Maniacs or Terrorizer. I think because this is all back. I mean, I know the internet was around back then, but it certainly wasn't the wealth and source of all knowledge that it is in 2017. And I remember thinking, gosh, I wonder who you're going to get in. And then, of course, Paul popped up. And with the greatest of respect to Paul, I just never felt he was as creative as Stuart or even Gian. Now, I understand that he, he wrote a lot of the, from a comment that you made earlier in our discussion, that he wrote a lot of that material, but he just didn't have that. And I know you're not a big fan of that term, new wave of British heavy metal, but I really felt that Stuart brought that to the band in spades. Now, I've listened to his material. He's got a band called Ninepence, and it doesn't sound anything like that, of course. It actually sounds like doomy, sounds very doomy, but if he's singing, it sounds like, he sounds a bit like Ozzy Osbourne, actually. I had to sort of do a double double check to see if there was some sort of a vocal um, effect going on there or what have you. But uh, anyway, mate, I, I digress. As I say, I'm just a big fan of his guitar playing, and I'm a massive fan of both of those records, and uh, it'd just be wonderful uh, if it could ever be possible for something approaching a, a reunion even if it was just a one-off thing. But the thing about Dusk and Embrace was actually written by, the majority of it was written by Paul and our previous guitarist, Paul, because it was re-recorded. Yes. I think uh, there was only one song that was written by Stuart on that record. I think it was uh, his, his approach. As a guitarist, it's just his approach. It's He seems to leave a lot of space between things. You know, you know when I say a lot of space, he sort of is slightly behind the beat when he plays, and a lot of that, that, that lead guitar noodling and... Question about Gian as well. Have you had much contact with him since he exited the band after, I think it was after Midian, wasn't it? It was a little later than that, I think. Um, yeah, we did. I did have a lot of um, contact with him. I've got, I haven't spoken to him for, for a good few years, though, probably about five. Um, but, yeah, I, I had contact with him for a while. Cool, mate, yeah. All right, well, mate, um, Australia. You've had a uh, what I feel is a very long and fruitful relationship with us here, and I was actually one of the few people that was in the crowd. Remember that show that you did back in 1997, the Roadblock Festival in Sydney, and you went on stage at about 1 o'clock or something like that? It was very late. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I remember, and you really blew me away. Even though it was late, your performance that night was outstanding, and I do recall vividly that you played one or two tracks from the upcoming album, which, of course, at that time was Cruelty, and, and thinking how wonderful that they were, but... What are your memories of that tour in particular? Um, if I, I don't even remember that, to be honest. That seems a little... Are you sure that happened? <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually thought we, the last time we... The first time we toured Australia was um, was 99, after Cruelty. No, it was 97, believe me. I was, in the, I was in the audience. Yeah, I was definitely there. You played at a place called Selena's at Coogee Bay Hotel. Um and I remember meeting the bloke who actually put on the show because he was running one of the record stores in Sydney City at the time. And I said, God, what happened <laughs> effectively that night? Because there were all of these, with the greatest of respect, we didn't have a very strong scene in terms of quality in Australia at that time. And he tried to cram all of these bands in before you, which forced you guys to go on very late. And yes, I yeah, I do. I, yes, I do remember that now quite vividly, actually. Yeah, I just get my boy. <laughs> uh, it's it. A lot of things happened within a, a, a spate of a few years back then. Hmm. So it does get a little, a little muddled. Yeah, I do remember that, actually, yeah. I'll never forget, you, you have issued the funniest one-liner I've ever heard on stage in my life and with the greatest of respect to Michael Hutchins and his family. It was just after Michael Hutchins passed away. And forgive me for saying this, anybody who's listening, but you said... Uh, this next song was dedicated to Michael Hutchins and a few of us in the audience looked at each other and thought, shit, we weren't ready for this. And then you said, I'm glad that fucking cunt's dead. And But it was your delivery. And as I say, I know well, you said it in jest. You didn't say it because you meant it. But my God, mate, your turn of... Uh, that's the one thing about you from stage. And of uh, The show that I saw that you supported, Midian, someone threw a Ingve Malmsteen T-shirt at you and you said... <laughs> 
had, how dare you defile my favourite guitar hero? But again, it was just a turn of phrase and the way you delivered it. You had half of the audience in stitches. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember those comments, but I certainly do. And I don't think I've had, I don't think I've, I've got to give you that compliment, actually. I don't think, particularly in metal, people seem to have a humour bypass. You haven't. I don't, I don't believe that. Well, maybe they do on stage, but this is the thing I always say about black metal bands because I spent a lot of time in Norway and my friend came from uh, Golgoroth and Godseed and uh, hung around with what a tantamount, in the public's eyes mm. at least, you know, the most evil black metal guys on the planet. And uh, uh, they're all sweethearts, really. Mm. And they're very funny. I remember... Um, the guy, me and the guy from Talker, uh, doing robotics at a party once, completely drunk and <laughs> yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah. Everybody seems to have a, a well. Most people seem to have a good. There's a few people who are a little bit up their own asses, but um, yeah, maybe in a on a you know a front for for, for the band image. Yeah, people are yeah, they're a bit serious. Yeah, but privately. I guess most, I, I, you couldn't be in a metal band without having a, a deep sense of humour anywhere, I don't think. No, no, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I guess I'm saying people on stage, you know, they put up that very serious front or some bands don't even talk to the audience, but you've always maintained a dialogue with an audience. So Certainly the yeah, shows that I've attended of yours, yeah. You know. um, mate, I'd better let you go to your next interview. I really want to thank you for your candor and for allowing me to ask so many detailed questions, especially about some of the stuff from the past. I want to congratulate you again on the new album. I do feel as though uh, it is the strongest album since Cruelty and the Beast. And, mate, I'll certainly be in the crowd when you guys tour Australia. Yeah, which will be, I can't give you the exact dates. Uh, I've got them in front of me, but um, our new management is a stickler for synergy and, mm. um, so subsequently, I can only tell you that they're going to be in, and he says that with a, <laughs> and then he's totally forgotten. I go, well, one second, I'm just going to call them up here. Uh, no, <laughs> that's Japan. They're going to be in May. May, awesome. Okay, no worries. Are you, are you just doing the major capital cities of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide sort of thing? Um, I think we're doing five dates. Okay, that would include Perth then. So anybody who's listening in Perth, fingers crossed for that show. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you it does include Perth. Oh, there you go. God, they're going to be – a lot of bands miss Perth only because of the logistics and the economics of getting over there, I think. So Perth fans are going to be well, we thrilled. Have, we, we have a day off before it. So um, subsequently, yeah, I guess we're on a plane or or, or on mopeds. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if I could just – yeah, the album obviously comes out September the 22nd. Yep. I strongly advise buying the special edition, which would be only a couple of dollars more anyway because it's got a cover of – um, our version of Alice in Hell by Annihilator on there. Oh, and there's also fantastic. Unreal. Yeah, That's one of my favourite called... tracks. Yeah, uh, and it's a track called uh, The Night of Catafalque Manor, which is probably the closest track we've written to that sounds like cruelty. Um, I, yeah, talk about synchronicity. I had a tape back in the day. I had the CDs, of course, but I recorded them to tape. One side had Dusk, the other side had Alice in Hell on it. Isn't that incredible? Well, well, anyway, Simplicity, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, we've been wanting to record that, I think, since the cruelty days. Uh, it just seemed right now. And also, we we bumped into Jeff Waters a few times, most notably on the 70,000 tons of metal a couple of years ago. Mm. Told, ex, you know, expressed a desire to, to, to cover that, and he gave it the thumbs up. And in fact, he's he's heard it since and on his website said it was the best cover he'd ever heard anybody do of Annihilator song, which is fantastic, yeah. which is, which is a great sort of accolade for us. Cause obviously that's what you want to hear when you do a cover. And we played it pretty close to the, to the wire as well. We didn't overly cradle it. Normally we, we really bastardize songs, but that's primarily because most of the songs we cover are not metal songs. We turn them into metal songs. So bear in mind that, that Alison Howe is, you know, it sits really well on this this album because it follows similar themes. It's very melodic and spooky mm. and um, ornate as a track. Um, so it sits very well next to everything else. Yeah. Um, but like I say, we, we, we tried to be as close to the original as possible. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's what I was saying. Best Buy the – because you get extended artwork as well. So Best mm -hmm. Buy the uh, special edition – 
I don't know why record companies even bother with a normal edition if they're bringing out a special edition, but hey ho. Um, And also to direct people toward the Cradle of Filth Facebook page because that's where that's being updated by our social media woman every day, probably sometimes two or three times a day. So that'll be the first place to visit to find out anything about the album, the forthcoming single release, which should happen by the end of next week, and obviously the aforementioned tour. Cool, mate. All right, well, again, mate, congratulations on a wonderful career. I do love the new album. Um, every, anybody listening, you've heard the man, get out there and support the band, get the special editions and go to the Facebook page for all things Cradle of Filth. Absolutely. No worries, mate. Well, it's been a pleasure having a chat to you. Um, hopefully we can catch up and have a beer or a coffee or whatever <laughs> choice of liquid, liquid you imbibe these days when you do come down to Australia. I'm in Queensland, so, uh, mate, I'll definitely be at the Brisbane show. Excellent. All right, take care. Okay, thanks, mate. Cheers. You've been listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series, and my name is Andrew Mackay-Smith. That interview subject was Danny Filth from the UK outfit Cradle of Filth. Thanks so much for listening.